Um, Ken Ellis is a PhD student at MIT, advised by professors George Kennedon and uh, Amanda Sola Lazama, uh, working on cognitive AI and the program synthesis. So he develops algorithm for program induction, which means synthesizing programs from data and apply this algorithm to problems in artificial intelligence. And uh, he will be starting as an uh, assistant professor in the computer science department in Cornell in the, starting this uh, starting next summer. Uh, so let's uh, welcome Ken Ellis. Uh, so can I just make you a co-host? Can, can you try again? Um, yes. Oh, okay. I'm unmuted. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much, Shaiwan. Um, all right. I will um, try to do... I'm trying to do the screen share, but it's not showing the window. Uh, it's not. Um, Try it again. There we go. Okay, now it's good. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you, Jayuan, for um, spearheading this, and also Dan for sort of uh, setting me up for this talk. Um, so there's been a lot of work on inferring visual programs just in the past like couple of years that. Um, I'm really excited about. So, um, you know, Jayuan has this really beautiful work on inferring um, uh, like these visual programs from very naturalistic images that capture like repeated structure. Uh, my collaborators and I have worked on inferring constructive solid geometry routines from a uh, different kind of perceptual input, uh, voxel fields. Uh, there's some related work from uh, Osbert Bastani's group on uh, inferring programs that can capture the repetitive structure of things like building facades um, or uh, work from Yang Long on inferring programs that can describe the geometry of real world objects. Um, and it's very clear, I think, why you'd want to infer these kinds of visual or geometric programs from perceptual data such as images. Um, even just setting aside like the applications to um, computer vision, uh, it would be very useful um, for us as uh, visual designers or as mechanical engineers to be able to um, automatically synthesize programs or to make technologies which can help us create um, three-dimensional models. And we actually want something that's kind of like a program usually and not something that's like a point cloud or a mesh. And the reason is because it's much easier to um, edit and remix and extend and build on something that looks like a program. So contrast this sort of exploded view of a uh, programmatic representation of a drill with the analogous point cloud or mesh representation. There's just so much more that you can do with the program representation. So Thinking about programs, I want to now return to this picture here and draw attention to the programming languages in which we are expressing um, these graphics programs. Now, if you look at each of these programs, they sometimes have a lot in common, like a few of them have for loops, but others look very different, like this constructive solid geometry routine here. And if we think of these programming languages as being like a representation for encoding visual input, then we should ask ourselves, what, why did we pick that representation and not another one? And in particular, we should be thinking, like, what, why are we hard coding these representations? Could we learn some of this programming language? So that's what this uh, section of this tutorial is going to be about. It's going to be progress toward trying to learn languages for visual programs. So I want to motivate this by calling out some work that Dan and I did a couple of years ago. So in this work, we made a system which can take as input a hand drawing and then infer a high level graphics program in a LaTeX like language. So here's an example of what it does for this input hand drawing. It infers a program with nested for loops. 
which can kind of capture the visual regularity that you see in this image. So the way the system works is really in two phases. There is a uh, neural network phase, which infers a parse of the image. So it infers what are the parts here? And then a solving or program synthesis phase, which infers a high level program, which is consistent with that parse. Now, the programming language we choose is really important because it acts as a kind of prior or inductive bias. It tells us what are the space of allowed interpretations of images and which of those interpretations are more likely by virtue of corresponding to shorter programs. And the kind of inductive bias you get from having a programming language as your representation of how you're interpreting an image actually matters because it can be used to correct mistakes that are made in the bottom-up perceptual process. So to illustrate this idea within uh, the context of this work that Dan and I did, um, here is an example hand drawing. And if you just pass this hand drawing to the first phase of our pipeline, the neural network spits out a parse which renders like this. So you can see that it's made a small mistake. Um, but if you were to imagine writing code that described the output of the neural network, meaning code in a high level programming language, that code would be really long and unwieldy because it couldn't pick up on this global pattern that you could concisely describe with a for loop. But if you have an inductive bias, which favors more parsimonious or more naturally structured programs, then the top down influence of that inductive bias can interact with the bottom-up proposal from the neural network and the resolution of that interaction can correct mistakes such as the one illustrated here. So this language matters because A, it can actually help you do better perception, but also B, it's really the way in which we are representing our percepts. So we should be asking ourselves, how can we learn this representation just like we learn so many other representations? So could we learn this graphics programming language? I'm going to assume a setup where we have some space of possible languages, and we also have a training set of images. Now, I'm not gonna assume that we also have a training set of programs, because remember, the game we're playing is to try and learn the language. So by assumption, we don't have those programs because we don't even have the language. So if we have a training set of images like this, then what we might do is you might say, well, each image is explained by some program and we don't know those programs, we want to know them. And at the highest level, we could tie together all of those programs in some common language. And our goal is going to be to do hierarchical inference and learn both the programs and also the language. In this cartoon picture, it's clear that it suggests a very simple EM-like iterative way of doing joint inference. You could just guess what the language is and then say, okay, what programs given that language work best with my images and then infer the programs. And then once you have those, pop back up to the language and so on and iterate this process until convergence at which point you might say, all right, well, I have a good estimate of the programs and also of the language. So I'm gonna be discussing an algorithm which jointly infers programs and also a language. And it works roughly like this modulo some other stuff I'll be explaining along the way. So our goal is going to be to learn this language and also we're gonna try and learn how to use it. So as I said earlier, part of this setup is defining a space of possible languages. And for now, we're going to make a very simple assumption and just say that a language is a library. It is a set of reusable functions or macros which can draw pictures. So our goal is really to learn a library of image drawing routines. And we're gonna start out with some fairly minimal and generic set of drawing routines and then through this iterative um, inference procedure, we're going to enrich that library by learning new domain specific macros or routines. At the same time though, we're also going to learn how to use this language. So in particular, we're going to learn a neural network, which is going to guide the search for 
a program which will explain each image and which is written in the current language. So intuitively, you can think of this as we're learning a language and we're also learning a neural network which informs how you use that language. So I'm going to illustrate um, this idea in a sort of classic program synthesis domain, which doesn't look like graphics, but which I think makes the concepts clearer. So here what we're doing is we're saying we want to synthesize a program which sorts a list of numbers. And the way we're going to tell the algorithm that it should do that is by giving input output examples. So we have some input outputs of sorting a list of numbers. Also, we're going to start out with some initial primitives, some initial library. And our goal is going to be not just to learn how to sort numbers, but also to solve many other interrelated programming tasks. So somehow we have to bridge the gap from the initial library, the initial primitives on the left to the task on the right, which is sorting numbers. So the way the algorithm proceeds is roughly following the cartoon I showed you earlier, of alternating between solving problems and updating the language or updating the library. And it does so hierarchically. It builds new functions on top of the functions that it already has so far in its library. So if you look early on in this system's uh, training trajectory, what you see in its library is a function which I labeled concept four because it was the fourth function that it added to its language. And if I were to give a name to this function, I would call it filter. So filter works by calling out to this other function called fold, which was in the initial library. And if you're not familiar with it, filter takes a predicate and a list and um, removes all the elements of the list which do not satisfy that predicate. So filter seems useful for sorting maybe, but it's not really there. So if you go deeper into this learned library of functions, what you see is another routine which builds on top of filter, which calculates the maximum element of a list. So this was the 13th function it learned, which is why it's called 13 or concept 13. And it calls out to filter, which is concept four. And if you look into the final layer of this library of functions that it's learning, what you see is a routine for calculating the nth largest element of a list. So this seems like it would be very useful for sorting. And indeed, once it has this 15th learned function, it can now write down a very short program which sorts a list. And it works by calling out to concept 15. And in English, I would describe this algorithm as get the smallest element of a list, get the second smallest, get the third smallest, and so on. So it's pretty short and human understandable. Now, in principle, you don't really need this learned library or this learned language in order to learn, in order to sort a list of numbers. You could re-express this program in terms of the initial primitives, but the resulting program shown here is long and cryptic and on the surface has kind of nothing to do with sorting. Uh, it's not just incomprehensible, it's also in an important sense, inaccessible. Um, you could not do any reasonable search over the space of programs in the initial primitives, which would result in you finding this program. In particular, the final sorting program that this algorithm finds, it does in about 10 minutes. But if you were to try and do a brute force search in the initial primitives and find this code here, the longer code, it would take far longer than the age of the universe. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain how this algorithm works that built this library and sorted these numbers and how it is applied to programs that generate images. So this program is called DreamCoder because it is a wake sleep algorithm. Uh, if you're familiar with the Helmholtz machine, it's an instance of the same idea. So wake sleep algorithms always have two critical pieces. One is called a generative model and the other is called a recognition model. And here the, the library or the language plays the role of a generative model because it defines a distribution over programs. It tells you what programs are easy to write. And we're also going to train a neural network called a recognition model to do inference in, uh, uh, of programs conditioned on images. Um, so during what is called the wake phase here, we're going to do program synthesis. We're going to infer programs or images. And during a pair of sleep phases, we're going to either improve our library, our generative model, or we're going to train our neural network, our recognition model. So you can think of this as being the same kind of Bayesian model I showed you earlier, but instead of a language, I've now just written 
library because that's the restricted class of languages that we're considering here. One twist is that we're adding this neural network, this recognition model, and together this hierarchical Bayesian framing with this learned inference model is what makes it a wake sleep algorithm. So I wanna zoom in on this picture and point out that there's three things we don't know here. We don't know the library, we don't know the programs, and we also don't know the neural network. And that motivates this three phase inference procedure. So during what I called the wake phase earlier, we're going to take some task, here I've illustrated it as input output examples, but it could also be an image or some planning problem, or just anything you wanna write a program for. And we pass it to our neural network, which biases a search over the space of expressions built from our library. So it's biasing a search over stuff in our language. And we're gonna search until we either find a program that solves our problem or until we time out. During what I called the dream phase of sleep, um, we're going to train this recognition model. And the job of this recognition model is to map from tasks such as images to a distribution over programs. So that means it's trained on pairs of programs and tasks or for graphics programs and images. So how should we get those programs and images? Well, the simplest thing we could do is we could just replay experiences from waking. So we could say, you know, you had to draw this picture and you wrote this program to draw it. So when you see that picture, predict that program. So that's a very simple source of training data. But a much uh, richer source of training data is to take our library, our generative model, and sample programs. Um, so sometimes uh, this is called like dream learning. Like when people talk about training neural nets and simulation, like they often they call it dream learning. So this is like a, an instance of this idea. Um, and the advantage of this is that we can draw as many samples as we want. And as our library grows richer, as the language tunes itself to the class of images we need to draw, these dreams will also become better training data for the neural network. During the abstraction phase of sleep, we grow out our library. And the way that we do that is we take programs that we found during waking, so programs that solved problems that we actually had to solve or which drew images that we actually observed, and we look at their syntax trees and we pass it to a kind of refactoring algorithm, which tries to find the most compressive new functions that we can add to our library. So in a Bayesian sense, like compressing things really just means like searching for the thing which maximizes the probability of the uh, programs given the language. So we're just kind of doing map inference in this model to try and find the most likely new library that we can use. So here, if you look at these syntax trees, they have some piece in common. So we would abstract out that piece in common, highlight it in orange, and incorporate it into these, this learned library. So now I'm gonna illustrate this algorithm um, within a graphics domain and show what kind of language it learns or what kind of library it builds for drawing images. So the way we did this is we built a corpus of um, logo graphics problems. So logo graphics is a graphics language where you control a pen and you have uh, routines which can move the pen around and pick it up and put it down and do loops and things like that. So we gave it these geometric patterns, but we gave it a relatively Spartan logo graphics language. So it didn't know about um, concepts like polygons, or symmetries or things like that. But what it did have were control flow operators and functions for controlling a pen and moving it across a canvas. So what I'm showing here is the result of running the algorithm on this training corpus. So on the left, I'm showing the initial primitives given to the learner. So this is the library started out with or the language it initially had. In the middle, I'm diagramming the learned functions as a network where arrows indicate what functions call other functions. And on the right, I'm showing a few example tasks and beneath each of them, the code it wrote to draw that image. So just to um, dig into this deeper, here's an example image and the program that it wrote in order to explain that image. So you can see that it's calling out to function eight and function four, which are learned library routines. And function eight is a procedure which draws spirals. And that makes a lot of sense because if you look at this task, it kind of looks like a, like a swirly, spirally beach ball. And so it makes sense that you would need like a spiral drawing routine in order to explain it. But it didn't have baked into it the concept of a parametric family of spirals 
Instead, it acquired that function from solving many interrelated training tasks. If you look at function eight, what you see is a routine for repeatedly drawing and rotating the same subprogram. So function eight, I think, is a little more interesting because it's a really a higher order function. It's like a control flow operator. It says, take this thing and then sort of tile it around in a circle-like fashion. So uh, in more detail, function eight is really the concept of radial symmetry. So it takes a body of code and a counter and then repeatedly draws that body of code um, that many times around in a circle. So rather than bake in the concept of like a symmetry into the language, here we're trying to learn that by building it into this uh, learned library. So this, so if you look into this library, you see uh, a few other functions like uh, functions that draw circles or others which are a little bit less human understandable, a little bit less interpretable. Um, like, you know, if I was making a graphics language, I'd probably build in circles, but I wouldn't build in necessarily this uh, parametric arc drawing routine. But it um, decided that when drawing this corpus of images, it would be useful to have this arc drawing routine. So now this learn library um, is in some sense what's training the neural network. So remember the neural network is a thing that um, guides inference. It lets you infer new programs for new images. And this neural network is trained on dreams or samples from the generative model. It's useful to look at what those dreams actually are. Um, so at the initial state of learning, it just has this uh, relatively restricted set of drawing primitives. And here are what dreams look like then. So um, I've color coded these dreams, not just to make them look dreamier, but also to illustrate how it actually drew them. So I started drawing at the dark edge and then ended drawing at the light edge. So if you don't do any learning and you just sample from your initial language, this is what dreams look like. So uh, I did cherry pick these dreams because most of the dreams are just single straight lines. Um, but you know, uh, to show you kind of the variability you get without any learning. So now we should look at dreams after learning. So after learning, what you see is a kind of um, uh, remixing or recomposition of latent uh, concepts and themes that it found in the training data. And often they look a little bit weird and crazy, but they're clearly much better training data than the initial dreams. So for fair comparison, these are also cherry picked, just like how the dreams were earlier. But just ask yourself, like, do you want to train a neural network to draw pictures based on this training corpus? Or do you want to train it based on this training corpus? So clearly learning the library is not just useful for coming up with compact expressions of programs, but it's also useful for getting rich training data for recognition models or for inference networks. So it's also useful to look at the system's learning trajectory over time. So at the initial point of learning, um, most problems are not solvable, but there's some easy problems that it can solve. So it can sort of bootstrap off of those, add some stuff to its language, and then after a few of these iterations, it usually asymptotes to solving most of the problems. And what you see if you ablate either of those sleep phases, either the library learning or the training of the neural network, that you get much lower asymptotic performance. Uh, I think there's a kind of synergy going on between learning a library and training a network to do inference. And the synergy works as follows. During program synthesis, when we're inferring programs from images, um, we use those programs to grow out our library. So as we solve more problems, as we explain more images, we get a better library. But as you saw earlier, better libraries give richer dreams, which are better training data for a recognition model or for an inference network. But as the inference network grows more tuned to the domain, we're able to solve more problems. And so you get a kind of positive feedback cycle. And that explains why both of these sleep phases lead to this kind of bootstrapping action. Um, there's also some quantitative data to support this uh, view of a synergistic interaction, which comes from looking at the evolution of library structure over time. So early on in training in dark shade, I'm plotting um, uh, the average library depth when viewed as a network. And uh, in brighter shade later in training, you can see that it solves more problems, but also these libraries grow deeper. So deeper libraries are correlated with solving more graphics programming problems. And if you choose to ablate the dreaming phase of sleep, then you get two things. One is that the libraries become shallower and shallower libraries solve fewer problems. 
but also for a given fixed library structure, um, you also get a further degradation in performance. So the neural network bootstraps better libraries, but also for a fixed library, the neural network still helps you solve more problems. And analogous but weaker trends hold if you look at the total library size as opposed to the average library depth. So there's a couple of things you should take away from this. One is that um, you know, one of the great advantages of having a programming language as a representation is that it should be interpretable. Like uh, human graphic designers and 3D modelers should be able to look at the program and edit it. But symbolic programs are actually not really interpretable unless you have the right abstractions. But if you grow the language, if you're trying to add new abstractions, then it might become better, not just for program synthesis, but I think also for interpretability and for the editability of the graphics programs. The second lesson is that um, just as in the Helmholtz machine or other wake sleep algorithms, there's a kind of bootstrapping action between generative models and recognition models. And here within this context, within this context, it means that there is a synergistic action between learning a language and learning how to use it. And these two, doing these two things kind of feed off of each other. So I wanted to close with a few uh, questions that I have been wondering about. One is how do we scale something like library learning or language learning to more real world visual programs like what Dan and other people have been showing at this tutorial. Um, like these logo graphics programs, like they're a, a domain in which to pilot these ideas, but really we need to push this toward more naturalistic images and toward richer, more complex, maybe even three dimensional models. At the same time, another direction of scaling is not just to learn symbolic programs, but to learn programs that can explain things like texture, organic shape, and to integrate, integrate that with the bootstrapping and library learning and language learning ideas here. And how do we get all these ideas to play nicely so we can learn our languages and also get them to describe things that maybe don't look quite like symbols. Uh, I advertise this as language learning, but really it's library learning. And languages have much more stuff in them, like they have data structures and types. And some of this we probably do need to build in, but other things, my hunch is we can learn and we might get something out of learning it. A big motivation for synthesizing graphics programs is you want to discover some representation that humans can actually use, that a designer can do something with. And the inductive bias here prefers things which are compressive. And usually that leads to things that are more interpretable. But as I showed you earlier, when it was learning that weird parametric arc routine, it doesn't always do that. So how can we come up with an inductive bias or some kind of objective function, which doesn't just reward compression, but which rewards um, other things we might desire, such as uh, how usable it is for human designers and engineers. So that's it. And I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So um, uh, I've got some questions for you. So um, I think the first question is, uh, so going back to your very first hand-drawn image uh, 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 idea, so you have mentioned that, so you are you, you were using, you know, program structures or some sort of uh, minimal description lens, kind of like inductive biases to uh, help to do, you know, uh, better visual recognition in a top-down manner. So uh, how do you think such kind of inductive biases can have an interplay with other types of biases like uh, uh, physical stability, for example, uh, in understanding natural things or, you know, um, in general, uh, you know, different patterns? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, so the, the kind of inductive bias that we have here in the systems that I, I was uh, spending time here on, um, they're really syntactic inductive biases. They care about um, what the program source code looks like. Whereas really what we want are more like semantic inductive biases. And the concerns that you just raised about like physical stability and stuff like that, like those have nothing to do necessarily with um, syntax. Like they're kind of screened off from syntax once you condition on semantics. So I, I think like um, the, the, you know, we, we need to explore the things you raised and like, also, maybe more broadly, um, like a motivating question might be what, 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 what kind of inductive biases should there be that are independent of syntax conditioned on semantics? Right. 
and this reminds me of like in the in the field of you know um, program sense, there's a there's a kind of uh, like a slight difference between you know syntactic, um, uh, you know like, like syntactic types or like a syntactic um, uh, denotations of different functions versus you know semantic denotations of different functions. So do you think uh, that's also uh, like a do you think like how your uh, framework can also be uh, extended to uh, better understand the semantic um, you know uh, you know, the semantic meaning of different function programs and, uh, you know, even the relationship between different, uh, relationship between the semantics of different function programs. So this is a little bit, you know, complex, but yeah, what's your opinion on that? Um, yeah, I mean, you might imagine learning something that's kind of like a, like a perceptual loss, but like for the outputs of programs almost, <laughs> like um, where you just, you, you learn something which like discriminates whether something is, the output of like a um, like a dream or like um, the uh, the actual training set and something like that might get at these kinds of things. At the very least, it would satisfy the property that it only cares about semantics and doesn't care about syntax. I see. So uh, actually, actually, what I was trying to say is that so uh, when you're say, when you're talking about this, like for example, draw a line um, a comment. So in your, in your language, is it, it is really just uh, like a like a com like a like a comment uh, in your in your in your programming language, but but instead of, to human it has you know semantic and meaningful interpretation like it is actually a, a line structure uh, like that can be visual that can be visualized and uh, uh, you know we have like arc the relationship between arcs and the circles for example and uh, things like that. Um, oh yeah yeah like one one routine might be like a special case of some other yeah, routine or yeah, something like that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. like another. Thing you might want in your language is um, like orthogonality or like independence. Mm -hmm. um, like as you just pointed out, like the the there's that arc routine and it's it's kind of a generalization of like the circle routine and a few other routines. And you might want to have an inductive bias which penalizes that kind of redundancy. Mm 